Well, hello and welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. As we continue on in Paul's letter to the Romans, our study, our 45th lesson. That's amazing. 45. 45, lessons. yeah, 45 lessons. 45, basically, about 45 hours. Filmed all over the world. Filmed all over the world, yeah. About three per chapter. So, um, uh, we'll continue on, and I don't want to make any rash assumptions. Rash assumptions, but the possibility exists we may finish tonight. I don't know. But before we even start, let's do this. If Mark, if you would just ask the Lord's blessing on our time together. Yes. Oh Lord, we thank you for getting us together and just putting this out on the internet. And Lord, get this to people who really need to hear it. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, get it to us so that we might understand it deeper. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said, this is our 45th time. Uh, we finished up in our last session. We're in Romans chapter 15, and we finished up in verse 27. Yes. So we will start now in verse 28 that makes sense god is a god of good order hallelujah and i do want to remind you that we we love your feedback so if you want to write to us at office at biblealk.com we'd love to hear from you let, let us know where you're watching from and uh, we encourage you to let others know about the bible study all of these 45 sessions are up on the internet yes. uh, and they're there to for people to see if they haven't seen them or for people to review. And we want to thank yeah. those who have responded and yes. sent emails. It really is a, an encouragement right. and a blessing to us to hear from you. Yeah. So thank you. And we really appreciate if you tell others about the Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Um, we do this with a purpose because God has called us to do it. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. All right. Yeah. Romans chapter 15, verse 28. Paul starts this by saying, Therefore, when I have finished this and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will go on by way of you to Spain. Whenever there's a therefore, you have to go back yeah, well, and see what he went right. therefore for. The, the, the finished this is, remember what he's talking about in the prior previous verses, is taking the offering that has been raised in yes. the churches to go back to help the need of the saints in Israel, in Jerusalem. Uh, that was a, a driving compassion of the church in that day. They knew that the saints in Jerusalem were in need, so here they are, and they are fulfilling that need by raising funds, putting it, entrusting it with the Apostle Paul, who was going to take it back to Jerusalem. Right? And he's talking particularly about the Macedonian churches in Achaia when he's talking here in Romans 15. So when he's finish that, when he's finished delivering that offering to Jerusalem is what he's talking about, and I put my seal on it, he says, on this fruit of theirs, I'll go on by way to his desire is to go to Spain. Finished, put my seal. You know, in times gone by, when a letter, a law, or, or a task was complete, often the one who was responsible for that would put a seal on it to close it, right? That was done with letters, it was done with laws, right, exactly. And it's done with sentences. When a person served a sentence, oh, there's a, there's a they, they yeah. tax them yeah. up on the law saying it is finished yeah, but the, or the, it is the, paid the for. seal would be on, if they gave them a certificate, it would be sealed to close it. In other words, the seal is closing something. It's representing the finish of it, right? So he's putting his seal. Now the reason for him saying that was that he would not move on until he had faithfully finished the task that had been given him by the Lord, mm -hmm. right? He's not going to—he's not going to get halfway done and move along. That's what he's saying. He's going to put a seal on. He's going to complete it. He's going to finish it. Yes. And when he talks about this fruit of theirs, these churches, he's—he's he's again. He's talking about specifically about the church in Macedonia and Achaia. The offering that he is taking is their fruit. Yes. It's what their lives and their love have brought forth. This offering. And it was the fruit of the Holy Spirit that had brought forth their love. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right? That's a, that's a difference. I mean, you know, a lot of people who are unsaved can do works. They can give to different charities and so forth. But that's not driven by the, the power, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. That is motivated. Um, it has no self-interest. 
The love of God doesn't seek its own. That's what it says in Paul. The unsaved Paul have self-interest. Well, oftentimes, I mean, there's some kind of self-interest in their giving. Self gratification. Right? Mm -hmm. um, well, praise God that they give. I yes, mean, it, yes. you know, it can accomplish it, right? This love, this fruit. Remember what John wrote in first in his first letter, right? First John, chapter three. He said, "Whoever has the world's goods." He's talking about us, the saved, the saints. Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. In other words, that, that love has to take action. Where is that from again? That's 1 John 3, 17 and 18. All right? Um, we need to be doing that today. I, I, you know, it's like if we have, if there's abundance any place, and there's need someplace. We should be moved by the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of God to bring a balance into that. And that's what Paul wrote to the Corinthians, right? Mm -hmm. So once he finishes this, though, what he's saying is that it's his desire to go on by way of Rome to Spain. Right? That's his desire. Why does he want to go there? To preach. To teach. He's under compulsion. His ministry, yes. Right. This is not, he's not, uh, he's not a tourist. No, okay? no, no. He's not going to visit the Vatican. That's his desire. Yeah, right. That's his desire. But as with other times, you know, sometimes our desires are not God's plan. That's right. Okay? That's right. Or we don't understand how God will work that plan. Mm -hmm. His ways are not our ways. They're still not our ways. His ways are still higher than our ways. Just like it says in Isaiah 55. It's all right for us to, to desire. And that's more than all right. It should be our heart to desire, to reach, preach, and teach all the world. That's, that is, after all, what Jesus, what we call the Great Commission that Jesus gave. That's in Matthew 28. To go into all the world and make disciples. So, he always has a desire in our lives. But... I don't know the specific in my life or your life or somebody else's life, and it has to be that He leads us, and we're always being submissive to Him. I mean, you you may think, and I know, as a matter of fact, I got an uh, an email just before we left to come here, you know, from somebody who has leadership conferences and everything. God may call you to be used in a position of quote unquote leadership, but He's always calling you to follow. Right. Your middle management. He he puts people, he may put people in a position of leadership, but he never puts anybody in charge. Yes. Because it has always got to be him, the Holy Spirit, who is in charge. And he you know, God's not looking for leaders, he's looking for followers. That's right. All right? Yes. I mean that's very simple. Mm -hmm. and, and remember James wrote in his letter, and he said that if we plan to go to such and such a city that we should say rather, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. Not James, making, James any, 4, right? Anytime they would talk about making plans in the future, it was well, God it, willing. Lord, the Lord willing, right. okay? I mean, we always have to have that caveat, so to speak, that we're subject to His will. I mean, it is good for us to desire to serve Him. It's a good thing to desire. That's what the Word of God says, all right? But we always have to keep in mind that He is in control. He is in control. Yes. And it has to be His will and His decision, Absolutely. okay? Yes. So the challenge for all of us becomes to continually find that balance that brings the proper mixture of our God-given talents, skills, and zeal mm -hmm. led only by His will and direction. Okay? It, if God has given you a gift, it, it should be your heartfelt desire to use that gift to serve to serve the kingdom of God, to serve the Lord, right? But it has to be by His will and His direction. Because the gift isn't given to serve you, it's to serve No, others. you know, again, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said that these gifts are given for the common, and it says it's given to each one as he wills for the common good, right? All right, in verse 29 he says, I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Mm -hmm. Paul had started this letter to the Romans by stating that he longed to see the saints in Rome in order that he <coughs> might, quote, unquote, this is a quote, right, from mm -hmm. earlier in the study, impart some spiritual gift to them. Mm -hmm. Romans 1.11. Mm -hmm. 
his theology was surely one that he shared in his letter to the Corinthians, right? Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. 1 Corinthians 12, 4-7. So, if you have talent, if you have a gift, it came from God. Absolutely. You want to know something? So it belongs to God. And He can call, but it's got to be you using that. And you got to, you have to use it. You know, this is the parable of, you know, that, that he talked about, the, he, the talents. Right. You know, if God gives don't you talent, bury don't bury it, don't hide it. You need use to be it. using it, and you need to be using it for the common good, to be using it to bless others. And that, so this was what Paul was saying when he says, I've come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Because he had boldness, he had confidence in the Lord, not in, not in himself, but in the Lord who called him to the task mm -hmm. and equipped him for the task. Does it say that the gifts of God are irrevocable? Yes, the gifts and the calling of God are so irrevocable. Yes. When, when he does it, he's not going to change. No, he's not going to change his mind. Mm -hmm. That doesn't now. That doesn't mean that you can't change your mind. Right, right. And, so and not use it. When anything right. happens, it's you, not him. Absolutely, right. absolutely. But he's given you whatever talent, whatever gifts, whatever skills, and you know that you might use them for the common good. Right. It'll be a blessing to you. Absolutely. I mean, when you when God uses you to give something, to impart something to somebody else, remember Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Okay, but he was bold because of his confidence in the Lord, and he was persuaded and convinced that God would use him to bless whatever body of believers he spent time with, and he expected to be blessed in turn. Right? He wrote to Timothy what he knew from the Word and the evidence of his own life. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, the King James says fear, right? Mm -hmm. But of power and love and discipline, or boldness. 2 Timothy 1.7. So he had this boldness in his own life. And it's not, that it has nothing to do with pride. No. Quite the contrary. It had everything to do with humility. His, his confidence wasn't self-confidence. It was confidence in the Lord. Go back and read Romans 8. Or go back and listen to the studies that we did in Romans chapter 8 if, if you want to find that out. I mean, because that's where his power came from. I mean, Paul was a man who literally, his life changed the world that he lived in. Yes, it did. He turned cities upside down. And that's what he said. Because he was persuaded that nothing could separate him from the love of God. His confidence was total and complete, but his confidence was in the Lord. And he knew that the Lord who had called him to the task would use his submitted life to bring blessings into other people's lives. It's the Word. Right? That's why I was just reading from, from 1 Corinthians. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for, this, for the common good. Saying the same thing, right? You, you ought to have an absolute assurance that God can use you what he has put in you starting with his love and his Holy Spirit to be a blessing to other people this is where the this is where ministry comes from it comes from a heart that has a desire to bless others to serve to serve others don't you think a lot of people think when they hear ministry that it's always preaching the word well that's that's part of the problem yes is yes, they think of ministry. And listen, this is something that the organized church has cultivated, mm -hmm. that, that there are special people who get called to ministry. No, every Christian is called to ministry. Mm -hmm. Some ministries are more visible than others, mm -hmm. like the preachers who stand behind the pulpit. That, and that's fine. But everybody has a ministry. And none is special. God's no respecter of persons. So if you get this idea that, you know, because you don't stand behind a pulpit, you don't have a ministry. Or because, you know, lots of people don't watch what you do, that your ministry is not important. You've been misled. You've been misguided. And, and therein lies the rub. Because we are guided. We're supposed to be guided by the Word. That's why we do these Bible studies. So we get guided by the Word. And not the tradition or the training of the church, which can be an error. You know, I think Christians would have a, a, a whole different attitude if they would 
continue to remember that in the workplace, whenever they, wherever they go and they're in the workplace, that becomes an embassy. Their ministry. And it's an embassy. Absol absolutely. For Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know if you have to use, uh, like Mark works in a, in a plant, right? right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to wear steel toe work shoes or anything, right? No, no but we're getting ID cards. Do you have to, can you, are you allowed to go in barefoot? No. Oh. Well, it's just a thought, because, you know, when God said to Moses, take off your sandals, for the ground you stand on is holy. Wherever, what makes something holy? The presence of God, right? And it's like, you know, when you go into... So I'm not necessarily suggesting in the, in the natural that you take off your shoes, but you should have a mindset that when you wherever you are is holy ground. Because you bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You bring the presence of God. You bring that holiness with you yes. into that place. And that is your ministry. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what you do, if you're doing it as unto the Lord, and you're doing what God has called you to do. And your co-workers are watching. Everybody's watching all the time. Mm -hmm. That's the truth, all right? That's right? So, you have the power to be a blessing. Mm -hmm. Because you, it says, you know, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, it says, we have this treasure in earth and vessels. Yes. You have a treasure. The love of God has been poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit. The Word of God has been written on you. You have the power because you have the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I hope you have the power of the Holy Spirit. You should be walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you don't, well, that's another topic, but, you know, th think about that. You can't be saved without having the Holy Spirit. You can be saved and not be walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you feel like you are, you need to seek God and pray for that for that baptism, that moving, that power of the Holy Spirit activated, be activated in your life, all right? All right, let me zip along here. Okay. Verses 30 and 31. Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints. Okay? You know about the thorn in the flesh? I was going to say, he's, he's getting troubled. Well, he's, I don't know that he is becoming... He, I don't think he's losing his peace. No, he's not losing his peace. But he, he recognizes, first of all, the power of prayer. He recognizes the truth. It says, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that comes upon you for your testing. It says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. When God called him on that road to Damascus, he said, it, 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 Jesus showed him what he would have to suffer for his name's sake. Yes, All right? So none of this has taken Paul by surprise. But what he's asking for is the prayers of the saints. All right? There's such power and he, in prayer. Yes. To strive, okay? Not just a little casual prayer, to strive together with him. Because he's going to Jerusalem. Want to know something? He didn't have a lot of friends in Jerusalem. The thorn in the flesh. Let me let me just read you this, okay? This is Paul wrote this because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. For this reason, to keep me from this is Paul writing, right? To keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. A messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that I might, it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ might dwell in me. At 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7 through 9. Now Paul had incredible revelation from God. He had incredible understanding of the Word of God. He had an incredible ministry from God. And what he's saying here is, so he wouldn't exalt himself. God's blessing him by helping keep him humble. Yes. Want to be humble? I pray that you do want to be humble. I mean, that's that should be a great desire in our life. Pray do it before a fall. Absolutely. You don't want to be proud you want to be humble yes. it's the opposite so but but if you pray and ask God to help keep you humble well he's helping <laughs> Paul yes. and Paul prayed Paul didn't you know Paul didn't want this thorn in the flesh no, whatever it was and we're going to talk about that whatever it was this isn't something he desired 
So he prayed. He said, God, please take this, take this out of my life. Take it away from me. Nothing. So again, he goes back and he prays and says, God, take this thorn in the flesh out of my life. Nothing. A third time he goes and he prays and he says, Lord. And God finally answers a prayer. He says, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> God always answers prayer. I mean, just give him time here. He says, my grace is sufficient. <clears throat> but there's such an imp incredibly powerful thing here that we need to, le to learn. God's power is perfected in our weakness. God will not share his glory with another. So to keep the glory from going to us, God makes sure that it's evident, that, that it's no in, that it is that. his work in our That's lives, all right? right? Now, to understand Paul's comment regarding the disobedient in Judea, right? As we, now remember, he's on his way to Judea, he's on his way to Jerusalem. And you got to understand this. Paul, I want to talk about the story in the flesh, because a lot of people, you know, they, about this, his eyesight. Well, about his eyesight, or, you know, some physical problem. And there's a great debate about that. I don't think there should be any debate about this. No, that's All right? very clear. Because it says a messenger from Satan was sent, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You have to understand that Paul was a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee. It says that in Acts 23. Yes. He was trained in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the most prominent teachers of the law back in that day. Mm -hmm. He states that he was advancing in Judaism beyond many of his contemporaries in Galatians chapter 1. Paul was a Pharisee among the Pharisees, right? Yes. Paul knew the law. Yes, he did. Paul would have, without any doubt whatsoever, have known that it was written. Yes. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come about that those whom you let remain, they will become as pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they will trouble you in the land in which you live. Numbers 33, 55. You don't think Paul knew these scriptures? So when he talks about a thorn in the flesh, you don't think in his mind it's popping back to the scriptures that he knows so well? Troubled by who? By the people who remain and are disobedient to the call of God. The thorn in his flesh was not his eyesight, like a lot of people believe. It was messengers of a false gospel. Salvation by works. Those were the Judaizers. And sometimes Peter was in that group. <laughs> well, everybody bounces back. I mean, but, you know, uh, yeah. the, the thing is... It's, I, I think religion and people want religion instead of a relationship with God. And religion is works. Organized religion, yes, has yeah. always been, since the time of Babylon, has always been... That's been the message from the garden. Yeah. The message from the garden when the serpent approached Eve was you can do something to make yourself like God. You can do something to, to make yourself, you know, get into paradise. You can do something. You know, you can't do anything except surrender to the will of God and receive the free gift of God. Salvation is the free gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. It comes as that gift. There's nothing you can do to earn it or achieve it. Nothing whatsoever. All you have to do is receive it. That's what a gift is, Amen. right? You receive it and use it. That's why I'm troubled by so many. I see these ministries, you know, send us a, 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 a donation and we'll send you this gift. Wait a minute. If I have to do something to get it, it's not a gift anymore. You bought it. All right? Could All right. you give me that number again? Numbers. 3355. Okay. So, now, the other thing, that one of the keys to understanding what I just said is that, remember what I talked about, the thorn in the flesh, mm -hmm. was 2 Corinthians chapter 12, right? Yes, yes. Well, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you'll see that that entire chapter is about the Judaizers, people bringing a different gospel than he was preaching. Those are the people who are troubling him when he's praying about this and talking about it. Just leaders. Okay. So anyhow, he knows what faces him. So he, he prays, he wants people to pray with him that he'll be rescued from those people. Mm -hmm. Paul had been clearly warned by the Spirit of God about what waited for him in Jerusalem. And while he was entire on the way to go to Jerusalem, 
It says in Acts 21, after looking up the disciples, we stayed there seven days, and they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. And so then, you go there? when he left there and went to Caesarea, it says, as we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns his belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Acts 21. So he, Paul was absolutely warned by the Holy Spirit what awaited him. And that's why he's, he's saying to the, to the church that he loves, to the people that hopefully love him, he's saying, pray with me, pray for me, that I'll be rescued. Okay? So the question becomes, was Paul rescued from the disobedient as he asked the Romans to pray? The simple answer is no. The correct answer is yes. <laughs> because when he got to Jerusalem to bring this offering, remember, he has traveled around through all the churches and now he's coming to Jerusalem to bring this offering to help the saints in Jerusalem. But because because of the uproar that was created by the Jews who were that thorn in the flesh that I just talked about. Right, right. Paul was arrested while delivering this offering to Jerusalem. Right? And to the best of our knowledge, he was a prisoner for the rest of his life. Is that when he was in house prison? No. Well, no, well, no he was in prison for the rest of his life. He gets arrested there and the Jews are beating on him and the Roman soldiers come along. And they see Paul as the problem here. You know, all this uproar is about Paul. So they grab him and they're going to beat him. And he says he's a Roman citizen. That's like right? So they, the Roman, no, so the Roman, so, no, that's not when he gets about two years later. He goes oh, to yeah, jail. They, they, they imprison him in Caesarea Philippi for two years. Well, wasn't that a house prison in Caesarea Philippi? No. Oh, I that was a prison was... prison, thank you. Oh, okay. I thought it was a house prison. And for those of you who are thinking about prison ministry, this is not the way to do it. That's it. <laughs> because that always seems to be the way God does it. Okay. Hmm. We need a from prison the, ministry from over the here. Inside out. From the inside out. Yes. And what one of the things that hit me when you're reading verse 30 it says to strive together. And I was thinking, well, it was talking about prayer. To strive together with me in your prayers. And I was thinking, there's different ways to pray, different levels of intensity. I was thinking something popped into my brain okay studying for a test is the same way you can study and glance over the material you can think about it but studying as in cramming you know and really learning it that's striving it's intense. It's that's intense. intense and if we would have to take a test on our prayer life what kind of study habits do we have what kind of intensity do we have instead of to learn the material but to, it's sort of the same thing, but we've not taken a test on it. Well, it's sort of the same thing, but if you want to talk about intensity in prayer, you need to, no, no, you need to think about my favorite prayer. Jesus Christ went into the garden and came out. Sweating drops of blood. Sweating blood. From, from the intensity of his prayer. That's right. From the that's, intensity of his prayer. That's driving. Okay. Paul is not a man given to, to, to lightness. I mean, lightness in the sense of, you know, same fluffy. Things that he doesn't mean. He's a very serious dude. Yes, okay, he he's a very serious guy. And, and by the way, it's only when you get very, very serious about the Lord that you'll find the fullness of joy. They're not, they're not opposites and equals. They don't count, you know, counter one another. You can be very, very serious and be very, very filled with joy. But Paul is a very serious guy. So when he talks about prayer, he's talking about serious, serious stuff. And yes, he understands that, what you're talking about, the intensity, all right? So here's a guy, he winds up in, in jail in Caesarea Philippi for two years, okay? And then he was transported to Rome from there. And he wound up, to the best of our knowledge, he died there, you know? That, that's kind of where his story ends. And from, uh, again, we don't have any assurances because it doesn't say so in the Bible. Right, there's no but there's, there's nothing beyond that last imprisonment in Rome, okay? 
in the time of Nero when there was a great persecution of the Christians, okay? So, he was put on trial before the council of Pharisees and Sadducees because of this, right? And it says, but on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed in my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. Acts 23, 11. So Paul had stated in his letter to the Romans that he had the desire to get to Rome. Well, praise God. God made he, a way. God made a way. Um, isn't it wonderful when the Lord is your travel agent? <laughs> yes. and, and it was free. <laughs> well, here's the deal. Because his ways are not our ways. And we think of ourselves, Paul did not. Paul led a life like submitted like Jesus Christ. Why do you think Paul could have the boldness to say, be an imitator of me, even as I am of Jesus Christ. Jesus prayed a prayer, and he said, not my will, but thy will be done. Do you not think that that was the prayer of Paul? Yes, absolutely. Now, it was his desire to get to Rome. Praise God. But his will was submitted to God the Father, to the Lord Jesus Christ. His will was submitted and directed to the, to the will of the Holy Spirit. So he's praying... You know what? It says, delight yourself in the Lord and He'll give you the desires of your heart. Yes. Paul made it to Rome. Oh. But let me just say, but if you don't think God had a purpose in the way, the route Absolutely. that God chose, That's then true. ask Felix or Agrippa mm -hmm. in the jail in Caesarea Philippi yes. who heard the word because of Paul being there. Or the centurion who treated Paul well. Mm -hmm. Or the people on the ship they were shipwrecked, who survived because of the presence of Paul. And was encouraged by him. Or ask Publius or his father, whom Paul encountered on Malta. Shaking off the snake. Yes. God has a plan. His ways are still not ours. They're higher than ours. So, yes, Paul got... Did God rescue him? God rescued him. Of course he did. Paul said, you know what? Paul is a man whose life was his life, his real life, from that road to, Damas on, to Damascus onwards. He was a, a, a man who had submitted himself to God totally and completely. All right? But he was a man who, who encountered trials, beaten times without number. And this is what he said, shipwrecked, imprisoned. You know what he said? He said, we walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. Because God always rescued Paul. Paul would say here in Romans, in chapter 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? The Word of God says, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. We overcome by our faith. Paul was an overcomer. Now, if you look at it in the natural and say, well, you know, how was he rescued? He wound up in jail. He wound up in jail because God had a purpose for him being in jail. Just like when he wound up in jail in Philippi. And a, and a jailer and his family were saved because God had sent Paul on that trip to that jail. You know what? If you want to submit your life to God, you will walk in the triumph of Christ Jesus. And Paul didn't see these as problems. No, he saw them as adventures. That's Hallelujah. Right. And, you know, people say that things change over time. Oh, that's the way it was back then, but he's not going to do that today. There, there is a guy, a young man, in his 30s has a wife and children over in Iran mm -hmm. and a year or so ago he was yeah, tried and in put in oh, right. jail yes. and I heard he is having a wonderful prison ministry well, I don't know. Yeah, it's I don't not know. wonderful to him but people are being witness to and just by him being beaten and not returning in kind they're getting saved yeah, I, I, I don't know, we, we don't have very much evidence of what's going on in his life. Right. But, I, but I would say that that is a reasonable assumption based on what you know about the guy. Right. right. Yeah. And I think he would not be there if God did not have purpose. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that is the point. You know, it says that the early church was, was fertilized and grew by the blood of the martyrs. The word martyr, by the way, is a Greek word for witness. All right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you, could, and you know he's not moaning and groaning. No, and God is, God is never defeated, and his people who walk in faith of, with God 
are never defeated either. That's that's a fact. I bet you his prayer life is strong. But but the thing is, I mean, you know, it's like God doesn't promise us that easy road. No. That I mean, you may be going to a church that promises you that easy road. You may be going to a church that focuses on you know a better you, a, a skinnier you, a, a, a nicer you, a you. better job, and a more prosperous you. Uh, you know what? God, God is God. He is Lord. And if you surrender your life to Him, He will use your life. But He will use it as He chooses. That's right. And sometimes that can be a real adventure mm -hmm. in your life. Hallelujah. So, in, in verse 32, He goes on and He says, So that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. Paul had written earlier in this letter that, that we and he exult in our tribulations. Remember? Yes. Earlier in this letter, Romans 5.3. We exult in our tribulations. So his joy was not dependent upon good circumstances, but on the presence of the Lord and the faithfulness of God's love. Romans 8, that's what I said before. The presence, the, the faithfulness of God's love. He was convinced, he was persuaded that nothing could separate him from the love of God. That's why he was, as he writes, we should be more than a conqueror, right? And he he came by the will of God, not by his own. He wasn't going any place on his own will. And he says he wanted to find refreshing in your company. Jesus said that in the world we'd have tribulation. John 16, 33. That's what it says. But in him we have peace. He also said, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. So our fellowship with one another should be, is supposed to be, first of all, a place of safety. It should be a time and a place of rest, peace, and refreshing. Now having said that, I would remind us all that fellowship accomplishes that this kind of fellowship that's not found in writing letters or on Facebook or on Twitter, or even in things like this Bible study that we're doing now. I mean, it's fellowship for the three of us. Okay? And I, I thank God and I praise God that we have this technology and that we can connect with you. But the fellowship that is refreshing, that is that place of, that Paul is talking about, comes eyeball to eyeball, face to face. It is us coming together. Now, I praise God, like I say, you know, that we have the ability to do this. But this is not true fellowship. No. Fellowship is, you know, God spoke to the prophet Micah and said that he desires that we walk humbly with him. And I believe that he means hand in hand. All right? That's fellowship. When you're in the presence, when you're walking with him in his presence. And that's why, you know, it says in Hebrews, that we are not to be forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We're supposed to not forsake the assembling together of ourselves. And that just doesn't, that doesn't mean, you, you know, once a week on Sunday morning. Ah, well, the, the thing is, like I said, you know, I mean, it's easy for me to say this. And you know what? Thank God for Facebook and Twitter and all the technology. That we can, I mean, Alice and I, you know, we just returned recently from time in the United Kingdom, all over the United Kingdom, from in, we were in Germany, we were in Kenya, East Africa. Well, we're in constant touch with these people. As a matter of fact, I mean, we were just, was it this morning or, it was this morning, right? We were on mm -hmm. Facebook with, uh, with Tim in, oh, yesterday. Uh, yesterday, okay, in Saddleworth over in England. But, but, but it should be in addition to, not instead of. That's what I'm saying. Oh. Yes. That, yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. It shouldn't replace. But it can't. No, it's not that it shouldn't replace. It can't. It cannot replace. That is not the fellowship that Paul is talking about here. That I just got through saying is that place of safety and refreshing. You know, it's we need that eyeball to eyeball fellowship where we become interlocked and part of each other's lives. Now the problem is, it's easy for me to say that about the technology, the Facebook, the Twitter, and the things like that. But the fact of the matter is, I've been to churches. Yes. There's, there's no fellowship. There's no fellowship whatsoever. No. And, be, you know, it's like they have a shared experience. Mm -hmm. Alice and I, at the beginning of this year, I think it was, we were traveling here in the States before we went overseas. And we were in, uh, 
we were, we were in another state, not here. And we went to church with a couple of friends of ours. And it was a very large church. And you walked in, and the guy preached. I don't remember what he preached about. And I'm not saying he didn't preach on something good or anything. I just, it doesn't, you know what? It didn't make an effect one way or the I, other. I don't, I don't recall it uh, no, 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 no. this time. No but I left there, and I said, because it was like going to a movie theater. Yeah. You know, and we sat there, and we watched, we watched the musicians play us, you know, a few songs, and then we watched him and listened to him. And it may have been a good word, but the fact is, we left there, and I said, we had a shared experience with these people, but we had no fellowship. We left there not, not any closer to any person in that room. That's not fellowship. You know, if you think that going into an auditorium where there's 30,000 people, if you think that's fellowship, you don't understand what fellowship is. And the Word of God says, don't forsake your assembling together, that fellowship. Don't forsake that, particularly now. In these perilous last days, as the time draws near. Drawing strength from one another. You know, I say to people all the time, as I travel and teach around the world, I say to people, you need, you desperately need, in this day and age, particularly mm -hmm. in these oh, perilous sure. last days, you need good fellowship. Mm -hmm. That good fellowship is being with brothers and sisters that you have a relationship with, who love you enough that if you're doing something wrong, they will Sorry. get in your face and tell you. Where is that done the most? Where okay, okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> there is a place that you can make the tightest bonds of friendship, and they last forever. Where is that? The military, okay. because you endure hardship together. You help one another. I do not. I know there's a bond, and that bond is because you're trying to accomplish something but you're looking out for one another that's what the bond is because you right. have my back and I have your back that's one um, there, there there's a guy on the radio that has books out and he's a financial plan and he's got two books out his third book or his third strategy should be how each of the people in the church can help other people well, you know what? If he didn't put it in his book, Mark, I can tell you it's I had a book. It's in this one. I, I, it's in this book, yes, absolutely. It's in this one. That's the and point. And that's the one thing we don't have is we don't have a relationship with other people in the church. Because we don't have fellowship. That's we are living in a culture today where people, you know, we, we travel, I can remember years ago in England, mm -hmm. going through town centers. England has the highest rate of teen pregnancy mm -hmm. of all of the Western world. <clears throat> And you, you go into town centers in most of the towns in England on a, during the summer, that, that day, and you see all these young girls walking around with prams at home, with little, little children and everything. Or you see these kids hanging out. And I said to Alice one day, I remember this was maybe four, five, six years ago, I don't remember. I said, I looked at this and I see a nation of orphans with parents. It's not that they don't have parents. There's no connect. You know, how often, no how often do parents and children sit at a dinner table and fellowship, have communion, mm -hmm. that commonality, sit down and talk about, you know, like this used to be the way a generation ago or two generations ago, you'd sit there and you'd talk about what happened during the day. Now it's mom's off doing one thing, the kids are off doing another thing, dad's doing another thing. There's no fellowship. We have lost that understanding of what, and this is communion. And when a family gets together, a lot of the very successful people, if you listen to them talk, they'll say, after dinner, we stayed around the dining room ta ta table and we talked either religion, finances, oh. politics, whatever. Those are the good old days. And the, those people are now experts in, the, in their field. Well, the, the fact of the matter is that was a culture. Yes, yes. And unfortunately, it's not a culture, it's not being cultivated in the Western world today, yeah. particularly. Family life in America, in England, in Canada, exist. it has basically been destroyed. Yes. And it has been destroyed because of the schemes of the devil. Mm -hmm. And because, the, I'm going to say this, because the church has not been a faithful witness, the church has not been faithful in its call to have that bond of fellowship for the world to see. 
Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that we, the church, we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world now. He's gone. We, are the, we reflect His light. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. People are supposed to see in us that which is right. And the fact of the matter is, the church doesn't look much different than the world today. So the world can't see the difference. It's, you can tell me all day long, well, we sit in our church building on Sunday and preach the message. Whoopee. We're supposed to be in that, in that building to be equipped for the work of service. That, that we, the saints, that fellowship, will be able to be refreshed. That's part of what this is. Mm -hmm. That fellowship is a refreshing to go back out on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday into the world. Well, that's what Paul said. And find refreshing. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what it's about. So, you know, I, it's something we need to examine. And there's nothing that you are doing so important that fellowship should be, a bro should be broken. You can talk about this in your church, you can talk about a religious, but mommy and daddy, I want to say to you, dad, I want to say to you, because you are the one who is responsible. You are still the head. You are still the priest of your household. It is still your responsibility, and you will answer to God for what you do. That you should not forsake the assembling together of yourselves with your wife and your children, particularly in these last days. Communion. Every meal that you have. Remember, they went breaking bread day by day. House to house. Dad, when you sit down with your children and your wife, you should be having communion. I don't know what to say to you. You upset me so much. I upset me so much. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do this real quick here in a minute because that's basically the end, the end of the matter here, right? Chapter 15. Okay, because when he says in verse 33, now the God of peace be with you all, amen, he's basically finishing the content of his teaching in this letter, right? And now, remember, his prayer at the end is a prayer of peace for the saints in Rome. To a Roman church that dwelt in what was the most prosperous and powerful city at the time on the face of the earth. He's preaching to that church in that city, a city that knew no peace, no true peace, ruled, ruled by Nero. He was, by the way, was Nero a man filled with peace? He was the first Roman emperor to commit suicide. He couldn't stand his own life. So then he goes on in chapter 16, and this is the end of the matter. This represents what in, in modern letter writing would normally be at the front, kind of like the salutation, the greeting, right? But in, in, in the days of New Testament, it was more typical, you know, that it was at the end of the letter. So the structure of this last chapter is kind of divided as follows. First, a recommendation of the letter bearer, Phoebe. She's the one that Paul, she's from Centuria, right? Just outside of Corinth. That's where Paul was when he wrote the letter, and he sent it to Rome by her hand. And she had a reputation with Paul as a faithful helper, not only to him, but many in the church. So he tells the church in Rome, you know, to, to take care of her, watch her, bless her. And then the second part of that, from verses 3 to 15, Paul is giving his personal greetings to those who are well known to him there. The scriptures which Paul knew so well command that one must know well the condition of your flocks and pay attention to your herds. Proverbs 27 23. Paul knew the condition of the people he ministered to. Okay? Yes. So he's writing his personal greeting to them. Through all of his trials and all of his travels, it's apparent that Paul cared. Because love cares. Yes. And then he goes on to a more general admonition and blessing. To greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, that was a common expression. You know, instead of shaking hands. Although that was done in the day. Yes. And if you find some of the Mediterranean cultures today, still Italians and Jewish people, they will greet each other with a, with a kiss. With a kiss. Paul says greet each other with a holy kiss. Because you take that simple greeting that is common, but you, re you take it out of the normal, or take it out of the common, and make it something special. It becomes holy. Because of the relationship 
Okay. Because of the, you know, I said because of the relationship, because of the depth of the relationship. We should have a bond with our brothers and sisters that is a supernatural bond, okay? Then he goes on to caution against the enemy, the schemes of the devil. Now the New Testament is filled with that. Talking about those who are disobedient, we have to be on guard. I don't think the church is very much on guard against heresy, against people that are coming into the church to divide the church, against false teachers. I don't think we're much on guard, but I want to tell you that Paul ends this powerful letter to the Romans, this world-changing letter, and he says to the church, you better be on guard against them. All right? And then he gives his greetings from the people that are with him. All right? Paul was not on his own. Jesus had sent the disciples out two by two because it's written in Proverbs that two are better than one for their labor and a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. So people were with Paul, right? And, and he's sending greetings from them. Now, in all of this, if you read all these names of these people that are in Rome, do you notice anything? Greet them, greet them. It says, I want to, I want to tell you, I want to tell you a name that was missing. The name that is missing is Peter. So now I want to tell you something. Paul and Peter, they were interlocked in faith. I've heard people try and argue about the contrast between Paul and Peter. I want to tell you something. They were, they are lockstep. That's a fact. If Peter had been in Rome at this time. Paul would have greeted him. Absolutely. He could not have greeted all these saints in the church and ignored Peter. Absolutely. So while the teaching of some churches is that Peter was at this time serving as the bishop of Rome, he most assuredly he was not even in Rome. Now that does not mean that he didn't wind up in Rome at a later time. But not when Paul was writing. But not here. And if he did at a later time, because remember, we determined in the beginning of this letter that this was probably written in the late second part of the of the 50s all right 57 58 AD now traditionally Peter was killed executed traditionally in Rome around 64 AD which is just a few short years after this okay so that could have been but surely he was not in Rome at the time that Peter that, that time that Paul wrote this letter and I just wanted to point that out because a lot of people you know I've said this before and I'm going to close on this Oftentimes, it is important to understand what the Bible doesn't say as much as it is what it does say. Okay? God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness in His Word. If it's not in here, want to know something? It doesn't pertain to life and godliness. Okay? So, your football scores from this past weekend, they don't pertain to life and godliness. Okay? What's playing in the movie house now you know, it may, listen, it may be reasonable entertainment. I, I'm not saying it's evil or anything, but it doesn't pertain to life and godliness. There are a lot of things that we do that don't pertain to life and godliness. And maybe in these days, which are more serious than you think, we ought to examine ourselves and say, hey, am I redeeming the time? And on that note, I want to say it has been an incredible blessing. As Alice said, yes. we have been doing this Bible study around the world. We have filmed, I think, from five continents in this study. Lots of, lots of different countries, lots of different cities. And it's been a real blessing to me, and I pray it's been a blessing to you. And I'm not quite sure what we're going to study next, but if you have suggestions about something that you would like to study. We may do some topical studies as long as verse-by-verse -verse book studies. Mm -hmm. Please write to us at office at BibleTalk.com and let me know. We are, you know, we are open to hearing from, from God through our brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. So, I just want to end this by saying, Father, I thank you for a life like Paul's, mm -hmm. for a man who went before us, Lord God, and gave us that example of absolute faithfulness to you. I, I thank you for his example. And I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit working in our lives, we would imitate and follow that example yes. and be faithful to you too. Thank you. I thank you for the word that you've given us, for our instruction. 
that we might have those things that we need for training in righteousness, for correction, Lord God, for reproof. So use this word in our lives that we've heard over this time to change us, Lord God, that we might be more like your son, Jesus Christ, who is the word. We just praise you and thank you for all the time that we have together. And before we leave, I know that Alice wants to let you know. Jesus loves you. A lot. So we'll see you next time. I don't know what we're going to be studying, but we're going to be studying the Word of God, and I promise you that. God bless you, and goodbye.